Are the new variants of coronavirus emerging more infectious than the original one that started the pandemic? The United Kingdom, South Africa and Brazil variants could be much more contagious or easy to catch than earlier versions. All three have undergone changes to their spike protein. This is the part of the virus which attaches to human cells. The South African variant emerged in October and it has more potentially important changes in the spike protein than the UK variant. A UK variant has become dominant in much of Britain and has spread to more than 50 other countries. A South African variant has also been found in at least 20 other countries, including the United Kingdom. For the new UK variant, there is some research suggesting it may be associated with a higher risk of death. The evidence is not strong and the data is still uncertain, UK experts stress. As with the original version, the risk is the highest for people who are elderly or have significant underlying health conditions. So, what are these new variants and are they more dangerous? Well, to answer this and uh, other related questions, we're now joined uh, by health expert Professor Adrian Puren, the head of department of the National Institute for Communicable, Communicable Diseases. Uh, he speaks to us via Zoom. Professor, a very good evening to you. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Globe. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Now, Prof, we now know that several strains have cropped up in several parts of the world. So what's the tally now and uh, what form do these strains take compared to the known ones? Well, it's a difficult question because I think very often molecular um, typing of the, the different lineages has not um, always been picked up in many countries. So we know that there are certain dominant lineages that have dominated out since the beginning of this um, pandemic and obviously in the case of the UK and in South Africa we've certainly been trying to keep a track of what these lineages are and what these lineages uh, well may mean and as you know you've certainly mentioned the one in the the UK where there is a specific um, mutation that has given rise to a change in the protein and that has affected what we call uh, the binding to the ACE2 receptor and the ability to bind has probably increased its transmissibility, as, as, as it's called. And so what is thought has happened is that this particular virus has actually been transmitting fairly rapidly within at least England and other parts um, within the, the UK. And as we now see that it's actually being found in many other um, countries, you've mentioned about 50 odd um, countries. So again, some of this, the work about the transmissibility is really around some of the modeling. So it's thought that it's more transmissible by, let's say, 50%. Um, and therefore, we are increased, seeing an, an exponential increase in the numbers of cases that we've certainly uh, been observing in the UK. The lineage in South Africa does have that um, mutation that's seen in the lineage in the UK. But in addition um, to that, it also has um, several other changes and one or two changes that are of particular concern around, for example, um, the effectiveness around the vaccine or vaccine um, responses. But again, there's laboratory work that does show that this may well be the case, that there may well be, um, the effectiveness may well be have been diminished. But again, we need more definitive um, data to really show that, this, in fact, um, the vaccines may not be as efficacious. And similarly, I think for both South Africa and the UK, I don't think there is really good evidence to show that the, these particular mutations lead to a different um, clinical presentation and in terms of clinical outcome and specifically um, death. I think the what we're certainly seeing is a result, in, especially around hospitalizations and death, is most likely um, the result of the fact that we're seeing larger numbers of cases and a consequence of, is the overwhelming of, of health systems and therefore the, the, the specific outcomes that we're observing. Now, Professor, there's been suggestions that people who had survived mild infections with the coronavirus may still be vulnerable to infections with the new variants. What do you say to those suggestions? So, yes, so we, when we looked at reinfections, I think there were two. The one possibility that we always spoke about was the fact that if you had a mild infection, perhaps your antibody responses may not be uh, last that long. And therefore, if you were re-exposed to coronavirus, um, then, of course, you, you may become infected. The other possibility, now that we have to uh, take this into account, is, in fact, that there are mutations that can give rise to evasion of the immune response and therefore become reinfected. But I would like to emphasize that 
um, the immune response is fairly complex. And though we're focusing on the antibody response and specifically around these particular mutations, it is possible that there may be some level of protection um, from other um, arms of the immune system which will prevent um, reinfection. So we certainly are monitoring uh, the numbers of so-called reinfections from the numbers that we can see. Again, we've sent an, an arbitrary data of so-called reinfection. But again, very often it would be useful if we had the virus from the first infection and the second to really show that they are really different um, viruses. But that, that's going to be very difficult to show. But what we will probably look at are probably the increased rates of um, reinfections and see whether that rate in the context of a changing or mutated virus is different to that what we've seen in the, the early or first stages of the epidemic. What about concerns then uh, that the known vaccines may be less effective against the variants? So again, I think we need to be cautious. I think we have some laboratory data that sh certainly shows um, that the vaccine may well be less effective, but I think we need more definitive um, data. And that definitive data in part comes from the fact that we will use um, plasma or serum from those particular individuals that were um, that were exposed to the vaccine, test those sera against this new uh, virus or this new lineage and see whether or not um, the degree of what we call neutralization is any different. And that, that I think will in part um, tell us a bit more about um, this particular lineage and its ability to evade immunity. But again, just bear in mind that there are other parts to the immune system. So we need to really look um, in the whole context of this particular res immune response, whether or not uh, vaccines uh, will become ineffective or have a decrease uh, level of, of, of efficacy, as it's called. And what do you say then to those vaccine skeptics now that the African Union is already in the advanced stages of procuring millions and millions of doses? I think we should continue this particular program. I think it's really critical. I think the vaccine is a, an important component and a really critical component in terms of managing um, this particular epidemic. If there are changes, and this is not unique to coronaviruses, uh, there are other viruses, the flu virus is another good example, where there are mutations, one can then adapt the vaccines um, to meet the, the and, and to improve the efficacy of those particular vaccines. So I don't think we're um, stuck, as it were. I think that the program should continue, that changes can be made. Some of the changes may be easier than others, but I think that we should continue with this particular program, rolling out our vaccines. Na trying to wait for natural herd immunity um, is an impossibility. It's going to be very difficult to achieve that because it's going to take a long while. We're going to go through waves and waves before we reach so-called herd immunity. The vaccine is the way in which we will achieve herd immunity. Anything we can do to beat the pace at which the new strains are cropping up? It comes back really to those key messages that we've been saying throughout since the, the outbreak of this, um, of this particular virus is, that, is the reinforcement of the wearing of the masks, the physical distancing, the hand hygiene, um, the, the distancing is so critical. These are still the very important parts, even though as we roll out the vaccine, those aspects around the so-called non-pharmaceutical interventions remain and must be re-emphasized in order for us to really manage this particular outbreak. Well, experts believe that the current second wave in South Africa is largely driven by the new variant, which, is, uh, which they say is dominant in the country. And uh, other health experts are already warning of a third wave. Are we heading towards the worst case scenario? Well, I think it's really this, this particular second surge or second wave, as you've called it, I think is a really a, a good reminder that we're not out of the woods that if we persist in not wearing our masks, physical distancing, ventilation, hand hygiene, physical distancing in particular, and, and wearing of masks, if we do not introduce those or re-emphasize the importance of this, I think, yes, we will certainly see um, cl ongoing clusters and spikes, and in fact, the, the likelihood of a, a third surge or multiple surges. So I think it's really critical that we as South Africans at an individual level, at a community level, take this really seriously. You've seen the consequences in this particular surge, I think more than we saw in the first um, surge. So I think more and more people have become infected. The consequences of those infections are, are so clear to see in terms of the numbers of people that are hospitalized. 
And in fact, we've also seen the consequence of those hospitalizations is death. So I, th I think we really need to take this, this really seriously um, and really emphasize the need um, to have those non-pharmaceutical interventions in place while the vaccine is phased in. The vaccine will certainly be phased in in a particular way. It will focus on the healthcare workers and then other emergency workers and vulnerable uh, people in our community. But to reach the broader community will then certainly take time, in which case if we don't have those MPIs in place, we're certainly going to see um, the third surge, if you like. Now, Professor, having said that, does it mean that uh, in areas where more infectious variants have been established, then the current controls uh, are likely to be less effective? No, I think on the co un unless the, the viruses are directly involved or become, um, if you like, more virulent, um, then I would be of, uh, they'd be of great concern, of course. But my sense is that these particular um, viruses or lineages that have come about um, are certainly more transmissible, but the controls remain the same. And, and we need to emphasize that. So in other words, what we've seen in the UK, what we're seeing in the United States, where in fact we do think that, that uh, the UK uh, lineage is more dominant, it comes down to the fact that we need to emphasize the MPIs and re-emphasize them. So if you have to double mask, um, if you really have to keep the six uh, feet distancing, really control uh, movements of, of people, and those are the key things that we need to consider. Professor Adrian Purin, the head of department of the National Institute for Communicable Diseases, joining us via Zoom. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it, sir.